<laughs> so, um, uh, so this is um, this is a title of this, and I'm going to go quick through the background stuff. Uh, I think. Yes. Okay. So, what this is all about is is about an engineering ontology. Uh, what is a world made of? Okay. And one of the ways of getting to this is I started out as a physicist, and once you get into quantum theory, you go like, okay, what what is the universe made of then in quantum theory? And it seems to be pretty much unanswerable or certainly difficult. So the suggestion here is that that whatever uh, the idea is that the engineering worldview is actually a bigger tent, and that science will be a special case within that. So we're looking for a post-scientific worldview, and I'm going to argue it's middle ground, <coughs> linked to complementarity. I'm also going to say that thermodynamics uh, is very crucial, and then this unexpected link to uh, quantum theory. So just background again. Uh, an article on that thing, and it, it basically saying, <clears throat> and looking for what we're looking for is a post-scientific engineering framework. And the criteria, one of the criteria is uh, that uh, say subsume and supersede. Uh, what that means is that everything, all of uh, all all the places where science or scientific areas work, uh, we must be able to explain that. Okay, make sense of it. And supersede means essentially that we're going to understand science in a new way. Uh, so and all the deterministic scientific mechanical theories are going to be special cases within this more general uh, engineering theory. That shouldn't be too surprising from the point of view of quantum theory too, because quantum theory is doing the same thing. Quantum theory says we're post science, we're post mechanical. I mean, there is no one mechanics anymore. Okay, this is another thing that's just coming out. So I wrote another one following up on this general idea. And uh, what you know, what is uh, Engineering epistemology. What, are, what, are, what is engineering knowledge? I very much like Vincenti's uh, stuff, and basically the idea that engineering knowledge is comes downstream from science is wrong. And uh, Petrovsky takes it the next step, and he says everything you thought was science uh, is really engineering. I, I tend to agree with that, but it takes a bit to do it. And also in, in doing this, there's a lot of links to uh, American pragmatism and all those guys. And, and one. People say, "What's philosophy of engineering?" Uh, it's, an, it's a euphemism for pragmatism, uh, and it sort of is. <laughs> but but pragmatism has so much baggage. I just normally avoid it because everybody has their opinion on what pragmatism is and who said this and who said that. So I just avoid it. But another way to say it is that pragmatism is an early attempt at a philosophy of engineering. Okay, uh, my my current project. You now I'll, I'll, I'll get to why this is. This is the genius. In Lazar Carnot, if you've never heard of Lazar Carnot, you will hear of Lazar Carnot. He is uh, actually, and I, I'm getting clearer and clearer on why nobody knows about him, because he was the key guy. He was one of the three people running the French Revolution, and it was his decision to, uh, to uh, uh, take off the head of Louis XVI. And so when, they, <laughs> when the monarchy got back in, they banned all his books and everything. So he was rediscovered by uh, uh, this Princeton historian, uh, Gillespie, and since then, more and more stuff. So anyway, I'm currently involved in translating into English, which I've never done. It's three of these major works. Uh, okay, so post-scientific ontology. What is a post-scientific ontology? Well, so they asked Bohr, you know, what is, this question of quantum realism, they asked Bohr, you know, what is reality? You know, what is it made of? And stuff like that. And his statement said, there is no quantum reality. Get over it. And what he's saying there, and another way of saying that is that he's saying there's no scientific type of reality there, okay? So, uh, now Heisenberg's insight, as I call it, for lack of a better thing, is uh, it's not only the particles and waves that are complementary, but it's the ways of observing them. So if one experimental setup is observing particles and another is observing waves, those, are, those experimental setups are also complementary. And, uh, and I take a step further, the way of setting up that particular experimental setup, the way of setting up another particular seminar. These are ways of acting. They have to be complementary. Okay, but then Broy comes along and says, well, all phenomena are, uh, you know, if you're looking at particle phenomena, there's a wave aspect. If you're looking at wave things, there's a particle aspect, so it's all messed up. So extend that uh, all experimental designs embody complementary aspects. So if you try and do something one way, it always has a little bit of the other. 
And so the general push here is that all structures and processes uh, embody complementary aspects. So the just general idea here is going to be that the, the world is made up of, everything that the world is made up of, and all functions in the world have this complementary dual aspect to them. Uh, Bohr didn't miss this. This is his, his coat, of arm, coat of arms. And uh, so it, it, the things is contraries are complementary. I've been tracing back this, you know, con contraries, where does complementary come from? Uh, Heisenberg has a great story. He says, the whole uncertainty principle, all this stuff comes from, con this is drivable directly from conjugate variables. If you have conjugate variables, you're immediately there. What are conjugates? Conjugates are contraries. And this goes, I'm presenting it to you with the history of science here. This stuff goes back to the Greeks, have all sorts of lists of contraries and stuff like that. It's all complementarity, really. Okay, so the, my basic thesis in all this is that reality is middle ground. Uh, uh, what's it made of? Well, there ain't no stuff there, no eternal stuff. Uh, so what is it? Well, we're, we're so, and, and the corollary is uh, that this middle ground reality that we see uh, emerges through a middle way process, middle way design process, if you like. Um, okay, so just, I'm going to get into some examples here and then I'm going to get into deeper stuff. So what does that mean to say middle ground ontology? Uh, when I'm attending a soccer match, am I, am I experiencing competition or cooperation? Well, sort of both. Well, these are complementary. Uh, so that's the example of a middle ground. Uh, the, the idea that reality is middle ground. Okay. So I take that further, uh, like Michael Oakeshott says all societies, and you can take uh, human societies, animal societies, bacterial societies, the ecosystem, everything has cooperative and competitive aspects. Try and formulate one that's 100% 100% another, uh, uh, complete nonsense. Uh, I like a recent book, uh, uh, Ferguson, Neil Ferguson, called The Tower and the Square. It's about hierarchy versus networks, about how systems work. Societies, different things like that, and uh, and basically the good, <laughs> he, he he plays them off, and he says, well, this one works, and that. but every um, every network has a hierarchy, every hierarchy has a network, and he says it's a false dichotomy, which is sort of the same thing I'm saying. Uh, okay, so this in the, in the book a while back, this guy he was <laughs> famous, he had his 15 minutes of fame, John Haight, but he, he wrote this great book, uh, uh, the Righteous Mind, why why good people are divided by politics and religion. And uh, this is one of the implications for systems engineering. So why is it that people are like, talking past each other? Uh, and, and how does that happen and why is that? Well, one of the reasons for that, as I'm suggesting, is the world is, in fact, made up of these of complementary aspects. And, and I, one of the little images, if you put a bunch of Democrats on an island, they'll soon separate into Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> Put a bunch of Republicans on an island, they'll certainly separate in it. Because both of them have, the way in which the system works is it has, always has these, uh, these things going on. So you need, we need to learn, if, we're, if we become aware of this, which is my, one of my punchlines down the line. Anyway, so another example of this stuff. Uh, uh, engineering world, the engineering uh, worldview is clearly a systems view. Okay, and that, hopefully that's not too surprising. But, uh, so example uh, of uh, the complementary processes going on, you see like this, the, the, the earth is, uh, is uh, non-equilibrium, but it's also enormously stable. It's a homostatic system, as, uh, as Lovelock and those guys pointed out. So, uh, and Margulis and Vernadsky. And, uh, so, it's, so these are complementary processes. So the agenda of the, of the CO2 producers and the agenda of the O2 producers are different. They're not, they're not uh, one type. They have opposite types. And uh, there's a great book by Falkowski. Uh, a bunch of my friends are working on this uh, Origins of Life stuff. And uh, he has these bacteria down there at the deep sea vents. And you have like one side of the bacteria are using sulfur at plus, plus three valence and they export it at minus five valence and the other guys catch it at minus five and, and use it for some and their metabolism kick it back at, at plus three. And this is very typical of these of these little consortia that are all over the place. And this is kind of a mini version of the CO2 O2 thing. He has a great line, he says, the one rule of of being part of one of these consortia is you don't outcompete your <laughs> the other side because you want to have anything to eat. Okay, so uh, these consortia and it also just chemically, these consortia are also productive. So they're, and same with the with Earth. Obviously, it's evolving. It's not just it's not just a steady state. 
it's an evolving steady state. Uh, anyway, very, very general ideas like why are there why are things stable? Is because they're they have these components. Okay, so um, so so how does evolution work? Let me say it via the middle way. So everything. Uh, uh, so all systems evolve through a progressive cumulative balancing optimization. I'm going to try and explain that. Just that's the pitch. Uh, so the, the, the uh, biosphere evolves, and evolution is a thermodynamic process. It's not mechanical. Thermodynamics turns out to be crucial to engineering. Engineering worldview is a thermodynamic worldview. Okay, fundamental fundamental physics of the thing is thermodynamics, and it's engineering thermodynamics. It's not physics thermodynamics. I'll get to. Uh, so. Evolution as a process is better understood as an engineering enterprise. My, my friend uh, Bill Martin has this thing going from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. He has this great line. He says, well, when the world has eukaryotes, he said, well, he said, Darwin is like tinkering or something, like tinkering sort of thing. He says, the world with eukaryotes is like, the eukaryotes are like a core of engineers. They're 200,000 times more powerful than any prokaryote. So they have all this capability of doing stuff, and they explore, and they invent things, and they create things, and they do all sorts of stuff. So that's the kind of idea of this, okay? Uh, and and, and if, you, if you drink the Kool-Aid, <laughs> uh, then you have to go to Cosmos as engineering price. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of stuff on this. Uh, I, I like John Wheeler's. So, and part of it is the, the universe doesn't evolve mechanically, get over it. Uh, but the question is, if it does all thermodynamically, what do we mean by that? How does that work? Let's say it's middle way stuff. Okay. Um, so this is just restating. I, so in my book, I have this book out if you want. A bunch of examples of this, uh, not as advanced as what I'm presenting here in some sense. But the idea, it, it, to see this in, in hum, very human terms, I have some buddies that were uh, in, in, in grad school or in London, and they were in this with a war college. I think it's called a peace college in London or something at the time. And they explained to me very interestingly. Like, the guy went in and he said, "You need to understand that the mindset of the Defense Department and the mindset of the State Department are opposite. The Defense Department is total paranoia. Don't trust anybody under any circumstances at any time. The State Department says, "No, make friends with people. Make friends with people. Make friends with people. You take risks when you make friends with people." So the idea is that these are opposite. And my friend, first of all, saying is that they, they don't work well together. And and the ideal thing, the balance, optimization, the way things should operate is that you, you know you don't want to like don't worry about people taking you know taking over your your state or something like that. But you don't also want to, you don't want to have no friends. So that's not a good place to be. So anyway, so trying to find the, the balance judgment in those is, is basically the lesson of this that would come out of this. Okay, and also the Tao of, I, I'm, I, I like the Tao, as you'll see. Uh, Bohr likes it too. Um, and I think that part of the Tao is, and this I call it post-rationalist ideologies, one of the problems is if you're like on the Republican or a Democrat or thing, you kind of like, well, if I'm on an island and, and I'm fighting the Republicans and Democrats, let's just get rid of the Republicans. We're all Democrats, everything be cool. Or we're all Republicans, let's get rid of the Democrats. Mistake. Okay, so any ideological, any like iteration of the same thing, you know, that I've got a rational thing, this is how we solve problems. Okay, uh, mistake. So, and that's the way things go. So, okay, so this is catching up. Just remind us where we're at. Uh, we're going down through this. I, just, I wanted to stick that in so we don't get lost. Uh, okay, so what we need now is to, so I'm going to take a, this is kind of like a change into some deeper stuff <coughs> about what is this engineering framework. And in order to get the engineering framework, we need to make a pr paradigm shift. But the paradigm shift is not just within science, it's, it's a paradigm shift that's going to go to post-science, okay? So we're going like science is going to be like, you know, something that we're going to explain but not embrace. Uh, so post-scientific ontology, uh, it must subsume and supersede. And again, it means that I have to be, be able to explain everything that science does, in, but it needs to understand it in a new way. Now, one of the things that comes out, as you put this in, is that, so what is reality? One of the things that comes out of the uh, Carnot and stuff is uh, these double negative statements. My friend Raphael Pisano just got, they're all over the place in engineering. And the same is like, it's not that there are no particles. It's not that there are no waves. And it's not that there isn't any objectivity. Objectivity is an engineering objectivity. There is engineering objectivity. Reality is there. Particle physics, subjective, but it's limited. 
wave mechanics, subjective, but it's limited. So, and, and there, you know, there, to say there aren't, I don't know if you're in there, there are no particles. I mean, this is uh, uh, quantum theory. I mean, particle, there are no eternal things there that obey laws by, you know, mechanical laws. So, but these statements are really, really interesting, and they're all through Carnot, and, and, and uh, Raphael says they're everywhere, and my friend Drago is saying the same thing. So anyway, so now I want to look real quick at the thermodynamics thing. So Atkins, this sort of shocked me when I first got it. Atkins says, well, there were, you know, there are two different uh, approaches to uh, thermodynamics. There was Carnot and, and all that sort of stuff, and then there was Boltzmann and, and Adams and stuff like that. And then he shocks me by saying, thermodynamics still has both aspects. And they're like, no, no, wait, wait a minute. I, I was told that, you know, that Carnot and the caloric, that was sort of a historical footnote. <laughs> so it took me three years to convince myself that, in fact, there was. Uh, there's the Boltzmann camp and there's the, and the engineering camp. My friend uh, Yolanowicz uh, was at, uh, he said, when I was getting my PhD at John Hopkins in chemical engineering, you get the obligatory thermodynamics questions in my, in my PhD orals. So if I said anything about about particles moving around. He said, I would have been looking for a job in real estate. Because the engineering thermodynamics guys, and I, I went through, it's like, and you look at the textbooks, and they do, they, they're really different, but they kind of like, they're not sure how to talk about each other. Uh, okay, so, um, and the part, big problem is that these are not compatible. Uh, Boltzmann and Carnot are not compatible. I'm not going to go into that here, but they aren't. Uh, so, the suggestion is, uh, um, Atkins says maybe they're complementary. I don't think so. I think one of them is more general, which I think is the engineering thermodynamics, is the more general, and that the all the Boltzmann and all that sort of stuff is, uh, uh, is a huge number of special cases and exceptions and stuff you see in mechanical engineering. <laughs> I went to a conference with these guys. They're all bringing up the same problems, trying to solve these problems of the mechanical version of engineering. It's like, not going to happen. Uh, okay, so then, so here's a big picture thing. Don, Don Cardwell, uh, lots of books in, in uh, engineering. He's one of the people that understood what really went on in the history of uh, how we mistake, how, how did we miss all this? And part of it is like, I was saying it was like, the generals who won the war write the history. You ever heard that one? So here's, you know, we, I, we won the war, and this is what history must have been like, right? Okay, well, the generals were basically the mechanics. Everybody goes, oh, mechanics is right. You know, mechanics is the right way of understanding the world. So the history of thermodynamics must be understandable in terms of mechanics, right? And you see this. Even Gillespie does it. It goes back and says, well, Carnot's obviously wrong there, and he's obviously wrong there. He's like, eh, wait a minute. So Carnot says, wait a minute. Uh, we need to, now the quantum theory says, wait a minute, mechanics isn't right, isn't the overall framework. We need to rethink this stuff. And this is a, really a project, man. So we need to th rethink the history of thermodynamics. How did it actually happen? Uh, relationship between uh, between Carnot and Clausius. Clausius just screws it up totally. I mean, entropy. I call my friends. I call them part of the entropy cult. Uh, they're, they, they're, anyway, so uh, and Lazar writes this stuff. He's writing. He he starts writing in uh, I think 1783 or something like that. He writes a treatise on on uh, the calculus and stuff and. Uh, and he, and he, he has his, this is throwing down the gauntlet, this middle thing, I think. So what I see, throwing down, to make it clear that he's not doing mechanics. And, and so he says, everybody knows there's a trade-off of velocity, time, and power. And this is just like, you know, how do I want to do it faster? I want to do it slower? You know, what am I going to maximize? What am I going to, what's going to be my extrema, so to speak, of the deal? How do I want to do it? And he's saying, and he goes like, you know, like everybody knows this. Everybody, the engineers know this with the different ways to approach a problem. But he said, I've looked at all the mechanical theories around, and none of them is able to mix, give us an explanation of this. They can't even make sense of the question. So what Carnot is saying is, I need a, he's saying, I need a world, and he's just, this is all these guys, it's not just Carnot, they're all at the Ecole Polytechnique in the like, I don't know, 1750 to 1850 range. And uh, they're all engineers, and not all engineers, they're everybody there. But uh, the Grand, Cauchy, and so forth. Uh, and basically what he's saying is, wait a minute, what's the place of the engineer 
you got it. The engineers in the world, folks, and that you know the the idea that the, the physicists are going to say, well, it's all deterministic. You know, isn't it quaint that the engineers think they can actually change the course of events or restructure reality? Because we, you know, so, you no. Know, he said we have to have a worldview. We need a worldview in which. I, as an engineer, can operate and, and yet still be able to make sense of, of these scientific relations. Okay, so here's the key. Here's one of the guys. So Carnot bases off this guy. And I'm going to stay on... on uh, so uh, Mopiar comes up with the same principle of least action. Uh, is, there's this controversy at the time, uh, this Viva controversy, so I'm going to go real quick. So there was this... What, what's conserved in motion? Is it MV or is it MV squared? So, uh, uh, Malpier says it's both, okay? And which one's appropriate to a particular setting depends on your choice of frame reference. It's sort of like saying, is it particles or is it waves? Well, it depends on which one you want, you have to make, but you have to make a choice, okay? Now, we're going to get a choice. Choice being a crucial thing here. So, and to give you an idea of this, well, it actually works, cool. So, uh, so what does it say action? He says all change is an action optimizing two complementary components. So there's the MV and the MV squared. He says it's always a little bit of each and each. Does it sound like quantum theory? Okay. Uh, and prior to the choice, prior to my cha choosing, like to look at a particle or to look at a wave, MV or MV squared, uh, it's, it's, it's dualistic, it's indeterminate. Uh, and it's more general than any one mechanics. Now, the, the, part of the thing of the least square thing is that you ask yourself a question, what's this, you know, the, the shortest path between two points? Well, it's a straight line, right? Uh, no. So you get gravity and stuff in the street. Calculate. This is a big problem that everybody talks about. But you see in this, you've got, you've got your uh, horizontal motion, so to speak, and your gravitational motion forces going on at the same time. And, and it turns out that the, cycl the, the, the shortest time is, in fact, to the cycloid. And he goes after Fermat it's initially. So, anyway, this is the thing they're talking about. This leads them to this idea that this is the optimized path. Okay, is a cycloid. Uh, the, the, the physicist might have a different idea. So Mopra, he goes on and he goes like all he must say all structures and functions of the universe are optimizations of complementary components. And uh, uh, so reality for him is middle ground. I mean, I'll go into some more detail. Uh, and for him, also optimization. So this, these, this coming together, these things is always an optimization of the two factors. You never get 100% one way, 100% another. So you're always optimizing. And and Mopatway suggests that optimization is sort of like is some sort of like a, a solution or something like that. So there's a purpose involved in this. Okay. So uh, a little bit quick history of this. This is really confusing. But what happened was. Uh, Euler, who's the genius, er, you know, the mathematician's mathematician, and first of all, I said, "Oh, Maupertuis is right about you know, look at the orbits of the planets. They're optimized to you know keep them to stay in the orbit, and they're for uh, energy and so forth. They're optimized these two too. That's how orbits work." And, and, and then he says, "Maupertuis is correct, but it's not very useful." Now this is, I've been struggling with this. I, I understand it now, but. Uh, I think anyway. So Lagrange develops a useful mechanical version of action and, and uh, principle of least action. This is confusing. So we have two things going on. We have the idea, the mechanical version of action and the principle of least action, and we have the engineering version of these. They're not the same. So the main thing about they keep in mind about Lagrange and what they do is it's deterministic and it has conservation and it has symmetry, conservation of energy. Okay. So that they're still operating in the mechanical framework. Lagrange is okay. So uh, so. Um, uh, Maupertuis and, and Carnot start from this broader picture before I've made a choice. So Lagrange makes a choice of framework and then he's mechanical. Great, but okay. So, uh, so here's my way of trying to get, get, get you to understand. So because there are these aspects, you, in order to investigate, you have to investigate one way or investigate another way. And, and Pauli has a great quote. It's Pauli to Heisenberg. He says, He's looking at an early version of quantum theory. He goes like, well, here's the deal. You can observe, or I say act or investigate, in the P way or in the Q way. But if you try to observe in the P, Q way, it will make you crazy. Okay, You can't do it at the same time. And that's kind of what Euler was saying about, about Maupertuis. He said, Maupertuis, yeah, you're right. The world is P and Q, but if I'm going to investigate and observe, I've got to go one or the other. Okay? 
so, and it, this uh, the implication of this for this this approach is that doing science, what we call science, requires a choice of frame of reference, boundary conditions, and so forth. Um, um, the genius. I really recommend you read this book. And somebody said the justification of the calculus. Why? Ever, I, mean, I don't know. When I went through it, why do we always assume the functions are continuous? Why do we, you know? So, anyway, he explained, and it's basically the same thing. Because um, my friend uh, Jennifer Cooper Smith says also, uh, you know, you can't do science without infinitesimal analysis. You can't do it without, you're sort of dampening out one in order to get the other, all right? Long story. So now what happens is, remember I said there's this, Lagrange has this mechanical version of action, and that dominated Lagrange, Hamilton, all this sort of stuff. A lot of problems with Hamilton and stuff, but nonetheless. So all of a sudden this thing happens. Planck comes up with the quantum of action. And Planck's or action is post-mechanical, it's dual, and determinant, and involves a choice. In order to collapse the wave function, I mean, okay. And I got an article. Planck is clearly aware of Maupartuis. He has an article about him. He talks about him. He endorses him. He says yeah, Maupartuis is obviously right. Da, da, da. One commentator says that uh, Maupartuis was uh, Planck's bedside reading. No. Anyway, Einstein understood action better than Planck did, at least initially, which led to quantum theory and relativity. Let's say this out. These are not two different theories, folks. They're one theory. I'll back up on that later. To make a couple minutes. Okay. Uh, so I, I was going to re, uh, read this real quick. This this is Jeffrey West, uh, uh, guru, and talking about it. And basically, he says optimization principles lie at the very heart of fundamental laws of nature, whether Newton, Maxwell, electromagnetism, uh, the motion formulation, the general mathematical framework. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, this needs to be minimized because all here's a all the laws of physics can be derived from the principle of least action, which, roughly speaking, states that of all the possible configurations of the system uh, can have, that it can follow, it evolves in time, the one that's physically realized is the one that minimizes action, so the one that's optimized, okay? So nature is optimized, and uh, so anyway, it goes through. That's the basic thing. Uh, Jeffrey West is no slouch. He's uh, a particle physicist and stuff. So, uh, Terry, you have three minutes left. I got three minutes, so I'm going to go real quick here. So, uh, so Maupertuis just says everything's, you know, uh, and I want to point this out. Optimization is a concept unique to engineering. It doesn't come up in physics. And the reason is, in physics, you have conservation of energy. You only have one thing, okay? But in, in so you don't have to optimize. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, we use those, uh, when we're doing engineering, we use physics. But optimization is a concept only comes up when you've got two different points of view, or two different frameworks that need to be put, brought together somehow. Okay. Uh, so this is my conclusion, roughly. Uh, uh, middle ground reality is a result of evolution of middle way of op optimization. The middle way is simply optimizing. Okay, that's what the middle way is. It's the balance where the Greeks told us everything in its balance, everything in its measure. Uh, so basically all function, all uh, change, and the evolution of all the structure and function of reality is through a purposeful, optimizing, engineering middle way. I could stop there. Well, this is where I was in the start, which is uh, Bucciarelli's deal, where he talks about the, the problem of the communication of the, how do the uh, uh, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, particle guys, electrical engineers, wave guys, how do they communicate? Uh, there's no analytical solution is one of the conclusions of the thing, so bump, bump. Uh, the, the solution of solutions for optimization is this guy Galley. He has, you can, they kind of, they have a, they have a Wikipedia thing on it, but he's kind of crazy. But they don't, it, they've messed it up a little bit. But basically, what Galley says is there's this thing called essentially contested concepts. And a whole bunch of what is reality? What is justice? What is, you know, and and then this guy Connolly comes along and he says, he says, here's the key: enlightened dialogue begins. <coughs> And the discussants recognize they're dealing with essentially contested complementary design concepts. So if you and I are talking about justice or anything like that, you know, no, you're right, no, I'm, I'm going to beat you up. No, the, the evolution of things and the way uh, the systems evolve it, it comes from this enlightened dialogue when you realize that the person you're talking to and disagrees with you something like that has another point of view that has some value that you doesn't make sense in terms of your system. 
So you need to say, hmm, my system must be incomplete. They're going to say, oh, my system must be. And then you start the enlightened dialogue. That don't work. Anyway, I could go more, but I, sh I should stop there. Okay, thanks very much. All right. Thank you. So I propose that we have this dialogue over lunch and uh, coffee <laughs> yes. breaks uh, the day more and what follows here are a number of uh, slides that didn't make it because of time constraints into the original presentation, but I think are worth uh, including here at the end. Um, they'll go into uh, Stephen Covey's uh, contribution in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, offers a down-to-earth practical approach to implementing what Galley and Connerly suggests a practical guide uh, developing an enlightened dialogue that can result in creative middle ground solutions to core policy issues. Uh, this is followed by some uh, just a reference to American pragmatist and systems theorist C. West Churchman, who uh, attempts to solve the problem, the really core next state stitch, stage problem. Uh, in social political theory, which is how do you design an inquiring system? And then finally, uh, Silicon Valley journalist Warren Berger, in parallel with Churchman, provides an update on the, uh, to the effects of uh, to develop a naturally progressive innovation policy. Uh, how should individuals, corporations, and nations design their lives, their businesses, their constitutions? Uh, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey captures uh, this idea of Gali's. And he wants to move us from uh, zero-sum scientific thinking to make a paradigm change. So scientific thinking is there's one objective, true way of looking at things, and that's it, and I'll beat you up or you beat me up, to where you might think in cooperation and competition, these, each of these has some value, and it's only by having a, a respectful dialogue uh, between them uh, that we will uh, be able to uh, make cr uh, creative design decisions about how to organize uh, ourselves and society and so forth. In what Halley, uh, Covey calls uh, habit four, think win-win, uh, same point, and he basically uh, wants to uh, clarify what he means by win-win, and it was worth reading his book, but it's not about being nice, he says, or about some sort of quick fi fix technique. It's, for him, a character building code for human interaction and collaboration. Um, by You don't want to out-compete the other guy, idea, his ideas, because then you're going to miss some value that was in his uh, way of thinking that you wasn't in yours. Gal uh, Covey elaborates on how you do this, and he says this idea is seek first to understand, then to be understood. An idea is listen uh, to what the other person has to say. And in his uh, more elaborate uh, process, you have you know, each person, then once you um, listen to what the person says, you try and tell the person what you heard, and the person corrects you until you get it right. And then uh, you have the opposite, and the other, you listen, the other person listens to you. And here, uh, elaborating on uh, habit five, the, he really introduces the key idea, which is to synergy. And uh, the idea is that when two people have one of these enlightened dialogues where they're both respecting the other person's point of view and exchanging and listening to each other's ideas and the values embodied in those uh, positions, uh, then and then thinking creatively, uh, it's amazing. Uh, new ideas are uh, start to get put forth, and uh, and um, those are new synergistic ideas. Uh, just to reiterate here, uh, the next two slides. Uh, one refers to American pragmatist and system theorist C. West Churchman, uh, who goes after really the core social political theme. And that is, how do you design a society that's an inquiring society, one which is constantly trying to improve itself, to think about uh, who it, what it is, and so forth. And, and uh, these dialogues, the alley dialogues, and, uh, and what Covey's pointing out are, in fact, crucial to an inquiring system. Uh, Churchman's uh, really a student of a student of uh, John Dewey, American pragmatist, 
And uh, this is a great book, uh, Design Acquiring Systems. And uh, it, it's really a very, very progressive, underappreciated uh, book. It was still addressing this question of innovation policy, which is how do you uh, make this system better and how do you encourage questioning and uh, mutual dialogues. And finally, along the same lines, uh, there's a, these are two books. Uh, the latter one is called A More Beautiful Question. And this is just by this um, journalist, uh, Warren Berger. It's all based in Silicon Valley. And uh, it's about what's now called innovation policy. And he, uh, like Covey, has a, has a kind of a strategy of how you do these things. And one way is when you're facing some problem, you, you ask yourself and your colleagues, if you like, uh, you know, why are we doing it this way? Well, you know, this design. And then uh, you say, well, I don't know why we're doing that. And then, well, what if we do it another way? Well, that's good. Second question is good. Come up with some ideas. But then the third is a kicker, and that is how would you implement that idea? And uh, it's an ex excellent book and uh, worth reading. And I want to mention also, uh, Berger had actually uh, an earlier book. The More Beautiful Question is a sequel. And the earlier book uh, called Glimmer and is how to design uh, how design can transform your life. And he focuses on a particular uh, guy, Bruce Mao, and uh, how his understanding of uh, design evolved. And in the end of the book, uh, Mao is asking, like, uh, not only how did I design these various things, but actually how do I design my life? How much time do I spend with my children? How much time at work? Uh, how much time to get exercise and healthy activities and so forth? Quite a brilliant book. Uh, and finally, just to reiterate this uh, idea of the middle way and uh, part of the Buddhist tradition. In uh, the middle way, uh, transcends ideas that transcends two extreme views that polarize philosophical reflection on the human condition. So you have, again, this idea that there are typically opposite positions, um, I would suggest probably complementary positions, like cooperation and competition. And in fact, what you need is a, I used to call it a, a bigger tent. You need a, a position and a way of thinking that um, is able to include uh, what's valuable in each of those. And by recognizing that there are these opposites um, and that they each have something to contribute, that then you can uh, engage in this uh, um, enlightened dialogue. Finally, just to reiterate the core conclusion that uh, reality is, is middle ground, essentially, uh, the result of an evolutionary middle way of optimizing so that um, uh, all action, all change, and the evolution of all structures and functions in reality is through a purposeful optimizing and engineering uh, middle way.